It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Now, you can find me at Opperman Investigations and Digital Forensic Consulting if you reach out to me through my email, oppermaninvestigations at gmail.com. Today, we have Robert K. Wilcox, and that's Wilcox with a, an X, W-Y-L-C-O-X, Robert K. Wilcox. That's his website is robertkwilcox.com, and we're talking about his book today because it's been in the news, The Truth About the Shroud of Turin, Solving the Mystery. Never done a show about the Shroud of Turin before, so I'm really looking forward to this. Mr. Robert K. Wilcox, are you there? I'm there. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you for making a good connection for us here. Yeah. Before we get into your book, The Truth About Shroud of Turin, Solving the Mystery, tell us about yourself. Who is Robert K. Wilcox? Well, I'm an author, a writer. I, I'm really a journalist. That's what I started out as. I was, uh, after I graduated from journalism school, I went to work for the Miami News. I became the religion editor after being a year of crime reporting, which you had to get out of or you'd, you'd really lose your mind. So I went to religion, and uh, we'd had a little old lady religion editor, and I thought, hey, religion's really good if you, if you treat it like a real subject. And I, Anyway, I took that over, and uh, I was lucky. I, I was voted the best religion editor in the nation when I was uh, at the Miami News. But really and truthfully, I guess what was going on was I wanted to be a real writer and write books, so I'm now... Uh, writing my 15th book, uh, and it's been on all different subjects. I'm well known in uh, in uh, military especially, but uh, Shroud was my first book, and uh, oh. it was because I'd written a bunch of articles on the Shroud of Turin. At the time that I did this, nobody ever, nobody knew anything about the Shroud of Turin. This was back in the 70s, and I mean, a few people knew it around, just a few but it was not, it had none, none of the uh, cachet today that it does. I mean, I was just looking on the Internet. There's so much written about the Shroud of Turin. When I wrote it, nobody had even heard of it, except in, in Italy, Turin, Italy, where it was kept. And, and then there were a few uh, fascinados, I would call them, uh, around America who, who, uh, who had studied the Shroud and, thought it was the burial cloth of Jesus. But when I first heard that, I the burial cloth of Jesus, why, here I'm a religion editor. I'd never heard anything like that. All I knew were, you know, we, we, we have our faith and so on. But So uh, I was able to talk my editor into sending me over there, and, uh, and I came back with a bunch of articles, and uh, that really uh, allowed me to, or, 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 or attracted Macmillan to publish my first book on the Shroud. and Now I've written a second book on the Shroud. And, uh, uh, and the reason was, at the, in, in the 80s, there was a uh, big controversy about the Shroud and some scientists... Uh, but before we get into that, let me ask you a quick question. Because you said you became the religious editor or religion editor in Miami. Um, was that because of your personal faith? Because when I look at your books... Um, these are the only books about faith. The only two books are about the Shroud of Turin about faith. The others are about the target no, uh, assassination uh, of uh, Patton, George S. Patton, and other target JFK, the spy who killed Kennedy. So varied interests. Uh, were you a person yeah. of faith? No, no, I, I I am. But at that time, that had nothing to do with it. What The reason I became the religion editor was I'd been a crime reporter for the news, and I wanted to get out of crime because it it it, it knocks you down. Mm. And the there was a uh, we'd had a, a religion editor who was religious, and I felt, hey, you don't want to be religious when you're religion editor. You want to be a regular writer, a reporter, telling you know just both sides. Mm. And, and I thought I could change that, and I did. As I said, I won what was called the Supple Memorial Award, even against the New York Times religion editor, uh, as the best. Because when you really get into religion, I mean, that's where we came from. That's, that's the very heart of great stories and so on. 
And, and I tried to, to reflect that in my coverage as a religion editor. And uh, when you went, you were the religious editor? No, I wasn't religious. I was the religion editor, and I tried to cover all religions. I have to say now, after 80 years of life, uh, I am religious, but uh, I believe that the shroud shows the burial cloth of Jesus. But at that time, I was not, and and I hope I answered your question, but uh, I, I took that job just because it was the only thing I could get that I could step up and uh, get out of crime reporting. And, you know, you say you're, you're about 80, so you're about 15 years, uh, you're about 15 years on me, and but you said you had never heard of the story of the Shroud of Turin, because I had heard of it, uh, like in, in a National Enquirer and on TV stuff, you know. I had heard of it. It, it had never crossed your... Uh, not at, not, not at, at the time that I was a religion editor. Hmm. I, if you're only... If you're only 15 years younger than me, I'd I'd be amazed that you had seen it before. Because oh, yeah. when I when I started on the Shroud of Turin, I've written two books on it. On the first one, uh, before I ever did anything, I did those articles about it. Uh, there was nothing about the Shroud of Turin. I mean, it was it was an anomaly. It just nobody really cared about it because it just hadn't gotten the publicity. There were there were there was one book before me. Uh, about the shroud, but uh, nothing else, and it was just it, it was just an unknown entity. Like today, you find it everywhere. Mm. The shroud of Turin, the controversy. There was nothing about the shroud of Turin, and I'd never heard about it. And I was a religion editor. Then, as if there's still people out there that have never heard about it, <laughs> why don't you tell us exactly what is the shroud of Turin? Well, the shroud is a, a, an ancient cloth. That go, we can date it back through existing documents to the 14th century, about 1354, when it first surfaces in, in Europe. And we can trace it from then on through documents all the way up to where it is today. So we know it at least was in existence then. And it's a, it's a length of linen cloth. And it's very important to understand that the shroud wrapped the man. It, 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 it's purported to have, to have wrapped uh, Jesus, but it doesn't wrap it like a mummy thing. It, 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 it wraps it from head to toe. Uh, and so you get a front and a back image on the shroud of Turin. Uh, uh, and it's 14 foot long, so it would have wrapped around about, about a six foot man uh, right from head to toe and it has this strange image this not strange it has an image on it which looks very strange it's kind of like a stick drawing and it's this is in your in europe today in in turin italy it's uh, very heavily guarded and so on but it looks like a stick drawing and it wasn't until the 1800s uh, 1898 to be exact when the first photograph of it was taken, that the unique aspect of the shroud was, was un unveiled. And that was that what's on the surface of the cloth is a photographic negative. The guy who took the photographs of the shroud, the first photographs ever took it from him, he looked in, he so was souping his negatives, and the story goes he almost dropped the plate. They had the big plate then. He sees not this stick drawing, but the, the, the picture of a real corpse in rigor mortis, a man who has been mutilated just like Jesus was mutilated. And I can go through those little pieces there, but he couldn't believe it. Here, the, the, the surface of the shroud had only this, uh, this kind of stick drawing. And the reason is, on the surface of the shroud is this negative. So you take a picture of it, and you look in your negative, and you see the positive. And that's when he saw a real man, a real body, that was mutilated just like uh, Jesus was now, mutilated. Now at that I, time, in, in 1354, uh, when it was on display there, were they claiming that this was Jesus? Yes, they were. Uh, from 1354 on... And there were controversies about it. The, the, it, it, it first surfaced in the 
uh, in, in the house of uh, of a, a, a knight, uh, a crusader knight, who had come back from this from the uh, uh, Crusades, and his name was Godfrey de Charny, and he brought it out and. And he had been a member of the Templars. I don't know if you've ever heard of the yeah, Templars. Yeah, I've heard of you know, basic common knowledge, Knights of Templar, sure. Yeah, the Knights of Templar. Well, there's a story that they had this, they venerated this body that they had, and so on. And he said it was the burial cloth of Jesus. But there were prelates, uh, religious people, who said, no, it's a, it's a painted fake. And uh, it kind of put it down for that reason but to say it's a painted fake is absurd there is no paint on the shroud other than paint that may have gotten on it from its travels from what i would say would be israel all the way to to uh to to turin italy so uh <laughs> it it was knocked immediately by a prelate there who said, no, it's a painted fake, don't believe it. He didn't care. He kept it that way, and the king of Italy bought it eventually, and that's where that's how it got to Italy. But the chain of custody prior to 1354, what do we know about that? From, from one, you know, 1 AD, <laughs> you know, to 1300 yeah, years, not, what do we know about that chain of custody? Well, uh, you can make a pretty good history for it. And uh, I'll get, sort of go through it. Yeah. Uh, in the tomb, you know, in John tw in John uh, twenty, I think it's called. Uh, it says that they they rushed into the tomb. Now they, they, the others had the girl, the late the ladies had been there, but they went and got the other guys. And John comes rushing in, and it says he saw and believed. Well, what did he see? What did he believe? Um, I think, and this is just a sort of an aside for me to say this, I think he saw the cocoon. Uh, the, the, the shroud was not unwrapped. It was, it was vacant. It, there was nothing in it, and it was a, like a deflated cocoon down there. That's what I think that means. But in any case, the early Christians picked it up, as they would have, with this is their Savior's burial cloth, took it with them, and the stories go, and you can find this out, that, that they go north to Edessa, Syria. And uh, they are persecuted uh, in the first century on. For three years, for, for, for three centuries, early Christians were persecuted. And in 15, in, excuse me, in 524, I think it was, um, we found, or not we, but uh, what, what is called the image of Edessa was found there, and it's purported to be the burial cloth of Christ. And this image, it's interesting to note that up until this 534 or 24 when it was found, the image of Jesus on all kinds of writings and so on was of a young man, a young boy, clean-shaven. But from the time that the image of Edessa was proclaimed, it, what, what had happened is Edessa had, had been uh, ruined by a, uh, uh, a flood, and they found this image, this cloth picture, in inside of a, of a, a building that, had, that they were re rehabilitating. And they pulled it out, and it, they called it the image of Edessa of Jesus. And from then on, the picture of Jesus changed from being a young man to the same face that you see now in the Shroud of Turin, uh, with the long hair, the beard, the truncated mustache. Uh, and so that's a, that's a big factor, I think, to show that that's, that was the Shroud of Turin, because it looks like that. And you can find books that have numerous pictures of how it changed, how the picture of Jesus changed. Anyway, they pulled it out of the wall, and this was in 524 A.D., and uh, it became known as the image of Edessa, uh, this, this long-haired, bearded 
Jesus that we see in the Shroud of Turin. And uh, there was a lot of strife going on at that time. And they moved it to Constantinople, Istanbul, now today, in 944. And the image of Edessa was taken out every week, and they, they uh, 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 exonerated it and said it's Jesus. And, it's, and in 1204, the Crusaders came there. There was some problem between... Uh, the Crusaders and the Middle Easterners there, and the Templars came, and and the shroud or the uh, image of Edessa um, was stolen, taken away. This is in 1204, and there's two. There's uh, nobody knows what happened to it until it surfaces in the possession of Godfrey de Charny in 1354 which is where we can now say there's a documented history all the way up. Now, this Gottfried fellow, was he like a high-ranking uh, knight? Uh, you know, you, you got to be like a, a big he shot was. to get a hold of this thing, right? He was. Well, yeah. I don't know. The Templars themselves you know, must have had a, a bunch of rankings and so on. Yeah. But he was, a, he was a big shot there. He, he, he was one of the leaders of them. And, and, and it, it's, a, it's a relative of his... Who, who who brings it out in 1354? The same name, Godfrey de Charny, but he was a like a a, a son or a, I don't I'm not sure I, I can't remember which what he was sure. at that time. Now, uh, so but you but you're convinced that this image of Odessa is the exact same cloth as what we know now of as the Shroud of Turin. Well, all of the indications are the same. Uh, they show you the picture. If you go to history books and look at the image of Edessa, you see the shroud face. It's a long face with this with with long hair around it and blood stains and and uh, and, and they exonerated it. So yes, I uh, anyone who studies it feels that way. Now, what about wasn't there a pattern of forgeries around this time of historic uh, relics and things? Well, I suppose there were. Uh, I don't know, but uh, the lineage for the Shroud of Turin goes through what I just told you mm-hmm. through. So I, 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 I don't know if there were forgeries, because the idea of the Shroud of Turin, I don't know that people even thought about it. Right. Uh, it was exonerated because it, it, they believed it was Jesus' images, and they were a little different than us. They didn't think about the other stuff. I, I don't know about the other forgeries. Gotcha. So then, what kind of a test? You've been you traveled the world studying this thing, right? Yes. All right. So then, what kind of testing have you have they done on this to uh, either confirm it or discredit it? Well, well, that was uh, in 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 uh, real contention, uh, but there's been there have been all kinds of tests today. Uh, they don't they don't let you just go in there and test the shroud sure. of Turin. They let you take. They they did back in in the um, uh, what was it twenty? Or excuse me, uh, eighteen? Uh, no, nineteen eighty four. Uh, when I when 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 the big problem occurred, uh, they did a carbon fourteen test on the shroud of Turin, and uh, it was. They got a piece of it surreptitiously, several people did. They cut a piece off of the very, very tip of the end of the Shroud of Turin. And it showed a carbon-14 test of right around uh, the 14th century. And I'll tell you right then, I thought, wow, I have been duped. I'd written a book, my first book on it, and uh, it's a problem. But... As it developed, it turned out that they had taken a piece of the shroud that was at the very tip of it, and it had been, it was a patch that had been done to the shroud. The shroud went through a fire uh, in the 1500s, and in those days they had people who could repair the sh- a shroud like this so well that you couldn't tell the difference. And they had what what these 
people who had said that it was a that it was a, a, a fake from the from the 14th century. What they'd done is tested through carbon 14 the patch that was made there in the 15th century. Excuse me, yeah, in, the, in the 14th century. So naturally, it would say 14th century. Mm-hmm. And it took us several years for this to come out. But uh, some other scientists, and, and now today it's well established, that that was, they first of all took that patch when they shouldn't have, and second of all, they took a patch that had been sewed into the shroud, and it was, in fact, a, a, a 14th century patch. So that's where they got that wrong. So eventually, um, all of that has, has come to pass, And, for instance, for myself, that's why I did the second book, was because now I knew that that was not the death knell for the Shroud. But but has there been testing done that proves that it's older than uh, the 13th century? Yes, there has been. Uh, And I can't tell you exactly. There uh, There are several people who have done tests, and... They've all they've they've tested particles on the shroud. They've tested the the uh, the the weave, not the weave, the uh, the threads, and those threads uh, have come out at two thousand years old. This is uh, I haven't got the exact information on that, but it's it's readily available. Now, who's in control of it right now? Is it does the Catholic Church in charge of it right now? Yes. Well, they got uh, all this money in the world. Why wouldn't they do definitive testing? Here, here it is. <laughs> you know, like say, roll out the lab. You know what I mean? And it, why not? Why aren't they doing that now today? I can't answer that question. Hmm. Why they haven't done that? Except to say that there were people in the sh- in the Catholic Church who didn't believe it, and they didn't want to have it done. It and they didn't want to have the tests. And finally, now where it looks overwhelmingly to be real, the Church has the attitude of, uh, you don't have to believe it if you don't believe it. We do. Mm. And, and, and that's, that seems to be their attitude right now. But I think when they believe that there is a definitive test that doesn't destroy the cloth, you can only take a small amount and isn't going to interfere with the image They'll let it happen, and uh, that's what I'm hearing. Now, a couple of questions. Back in the time of the burial of Jesus, was it common to, to place the, the, the bodies in this type of linen? Absolutely. Uh, to wrap a body in, in linen, um, if you... Well, common, I don't know, but uh, the story in the Bible is that uh, Joseph of Arimathea had linen cloth, and he, it was expensive linen cloth, and, and, and he bought it and wrapped him in it. So remember, this is a man who's revered. Yeah. Was, he was crucified, and Arimathea, he said, uh, Joseph said, you know, I want to do him, dignif- dignify him, and that's why he, he did that, I guess. And, and you, when you described before uh, that perhaps when they walked into this cave that they saw the shape of a human there, but it was empty, <laughs> that would be severely uh, convincing uh, evidence of resurrection to cause so many it, people. It would be. Yeah. It, it would be. Um, but I don't know that they, at that time, that they knew what happened. And I, I you know, they wrapped the body from toe to to head back to toe that's that's what we know and that's what the shroud of turin shows and i don't know that they would have the, the bible doesn't say they realized that he had resurrected for three or four days later so at that moment it was just that they loved him and that they had this was a momentum of him you know a, 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 a memento of him and so they picked it up. That, that, that's my theory on it. Now, what do you think caused this image to be recorded on this cloth? 
Is it blood and sweat? Is it uh, uh, myrrh and frankincense? You know, what caused this image to be planted on this cloth? Well, that's the interesting part. Uh, the image itself, uh, to be succinct real fast, I think it's a mo- moment when he resurrected. Right. Now, the image itself is very interesting. It has three... It has a three-dimensionality that nothing else has that. There's, there's no... Paintings don't have it. And what this is, what, what the three-dimensionality is, that you can, they can read it and make a holograph out of it. And every, every fiber that has to do with the image has been changed. That's the best word. Mm changed in exactly the same way. You take one thread of, of linen fiber, and there are about 200 little threads in there, and each one of them have been changed, not on the bottom, not on the middle, but from the middle to the top, in exactly the same way. There's no deviation. It's something changed them exactly the, the same way. And you can take um, space, uh, uh, this is, it's called a VP8 image analyzer, and they've done this. And because every one of those millions of little fibers have been changed in exactly the same way, you can make a 3D image of the shroud, of the man in the shroud. And when I say a 3D image, something that can be manipulated if you were to look at it on a screen you could you could turn him up and he could turn around and because everything is so precise you can't do this with any other image they just, it just doesn't exist they use these vp8 image analyzers to to uh, photograph things deep in space and it's the only thing that has this so you this is a very unique thing uh, that 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 the shroud image is made of and how did it get there? Uh, was it a, a zap? Was it a... Uh, I don't know. Nobody knows. It's the mystery today that they don't know. But the image is made up of these millions of little fibers that are dark where, they, where it touched the body and lighter where it didn't, and all in the exact same way. There's no way... I mean, to say a painting, this is a painting, is ridiculous. How can you hold a brush and, and do that and, and have someone analyze it and look and see that, that it only hit the outsides of a tiny little fiber in exactly the same way in millions of, 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 of ways, a million, millions of times? So that's the mystery of how this thing was was formed in my own mind. Uh, I don't have a problem with it. This is the moment of resurrection. The body changed from uh, material to immaterial. And there was a tremendous, I don't want to say flash, I don't know what happened. But in an instant, that's what made that, that image on the Shroud of Turin. And you're saying, if I'm correct, that, that there are images on the cloth where they were not in contact with the body. Uh, no, no, they are in. They're in contact with the body. The body, the these these thousands or millions of little individual threads, for lack of a better word, you know, each each one of them has changed, and it, it where they were in contact with the body to make like the bridge of the nose, where it draped over the nose, they're more clumped together. So you get a darker image on it, or excuse me, a lighter image on the negative. And as you go further away, they're less clumped together. They're changed in exactly the same way, but they give you the, the, the like, the cheeks underneath the bridge of the nose would not have been in contact with the cloth, but they still are on the cloth as an image. Fascinating. Now, have, has this... Ever been tested for biological material or DNA? 
Absolutely. Uh, oh, really? The DNA is hard to get, but the DNA on it, it's a, it's a male and uh, with, with blood type AB. The blood on the shroud is different than the image. The blood on the shroud came before that. It dried and hardened and so on uh, all over the shroud. And the, you can see all the different uh, uh, places where the blood came from there. For instance, on the head of the, of the man in the shroud, uh, there's blood stains coming down from it. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, it's not the crown of thorns that we see on most pictures of Jesus. It's a caplet. It's, it's all from the top. And that is very Middle Eastern-like. So it's a deviation of history to do that. Yeah, I'm looking at the uh, picture. If I go on, if I go on, uh, the man in the shroud is flogged and beaten, uh, uh, and they've they've actually seen that this is that the that the 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 gouges that hit him are from a Roman flagrum. They met, they 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 match that exactly. They had lead and dog bones in them. Uh, the, this is speculation by people who knew what the Romans used and, and the reason and the way it flipped out the flesh. Um, he has a swollen cheek and a nose. I'm going down a picture that I'm looking at right now. Uh, there's a shoulder bruise uh, where he must, must have carried the cross. Uh, one of the deviations of traditional pictures of Jesus is that it, the, the nails are not in the hands or the palms. The nails are in the wrists. And it turns out, and they've, done, they've, they've tried to cru cru crucify corpses and found this out, you put a nail in the, in, the, in the hand, it'll rip out. But you put a nail in the, in the wrist, and there's a, an area of bones which make a circle called Destot's Space. And that will fit that nail, and it won't come out. So that it, this is a, a realistic detail, different from what you normally see. Um, the one of the most interesting ones is when you look at the picture of the man in the shroud in the negative. That is, you're looking in a photographic negative, seeing the live, the real person. Um, the blood flows starting from that wrist. Going, they could seem to go up the arm because the man in the shroud has his his hands folded over his loins, so that you, you don't see you know his malehood or anything. Yeah. It's folded over there, but you it, it's it seems incongruous because the blood flows are going up the arm, but then if you think that the arms are going to be outstretched on a on a, a cross and he'd be hanging underneath it, it makes perfect sense. Those blood flows that seem to be going up the arm as they're folded over his loins uh, are showing you that it dripped downward as it would have. Gravity would have done so. The thing is, when you, when you read the, the Bible descriptions, you know, the flogging and the thorns, uh, the sword and the side, you know, all this stuff, he must have been a bloody mess, okay? But uh, I'm sure they would have cleaned the body before burial, right? Well, no, not, they didn't. No. And he was a bloody mess. And you can see it everywhere. It's all over. He's bloody everywhere. The interesting thing is, all of the blood seems to have come out when he was alive, because you can see the separation of serum and cellular mass from all of that blood. But on the ones where, uh, on, the, on the spear in the side, and it actually fits a spear, a Roman spear. That's different. It, it looks like this fluid came out, and then some old blood came out. Mm -hmm. So it's the, only, it's the only blood stain on it that is different than the rest, which flowed when he was alive. Because they, they they're perfect blood clots. They show the separation of serum and cellular mass on all of them. They flowed and hardened they put him in the in the shroud i got they took him off the cross put him in the shroud took him to the to the tomb 
and then laid that shroud over him, probably never undid it because it was both around the whole body from toes to head. Back yeah, that's to right. Toes. There's no signs of it being unwrapped or anything like that, right? It's this is not at all. Yeah. Not at all. He, he, that's that's one of the well, great mysteries of the shroud. How did the body get out of the shroud without all of those blood stains would have been would have hardened into the into the shroud itself. And so when you ripped it up, you would have ripped those blood stains, but they don't show you ripped blood stains. They show you perfect borders on the blood stains. So that body got out of that shroud without messing any of the millions, not millions, well, thousands of blood stains all over it. Now, did you to, get that? Yeah, I'm, I'm hearing you. I'm at the edge of my seat. <laughs> it's yeah. really, yeah. really, it's intense uh, stuff, you know. Couple, yeah, it is. Yeah, a couple of questions now. Oh, do we have any uh, other examples of modern day uh, deceased bodies that are wrapped in a blanket in a hospital or something like that, where, where some kind of image like this is, has been duplicated in, in no, any way? No, we don't. We don't, and, and it's a good question. And I, when I was in France. Uh, you know, on my search for the truth of the Shroud of Turin, I thought, just like you did, well, now let's go look at some bodies, at some at some burial shrouds, yeah. and see how they, uh, you know, measure up. And I went to the Louvre, and uh, I remember the guy, he was a uh, Catholic priest, and he took me down to the, to the area where they had all the burial cloths, and he, he, opened, them, he opened up these these boxes, I guess, and started showing me. He says, no, you never get a picture of anybody on it. Look at this. And all you could see was the swirls of decomposition. Mm. Everybody put in a shroud like that would decompose, and it would it would mess up the whatever was on the shroud, whatever was on their burial cloth. So, no, you can't find it. This is unique. It, there's, it, it, that body got out of that shroud somehow without decomposing or tearing <laughs> your, your, your blood's going to dry and into the, the fabric that's you know? correct that's yeah. or tearing that's yeah. correct and do we have another... nobody 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 lifted nobody lifted that shroud off of the body because it would have ripped it would have ripped all the numerous 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 uh dried blood clots in, into two pieces do we have any other cloth samples of uh, cloth from that, that that has survived since 1300? Well, I'm sure there's many of them uh, really? around. I've never found them, but the point being that, uh, I, well, I don't know what the point is. I, uh, I just, I, I, I'm when you when you find a burial cloth, what you find are the swirls of decomposition, because the body stays in the cloth and decomposes and obliterates what's ever there. And all you see is like someone took a brush with yeah. some kind of foul liquid and swirled it all around. That's what you see. See, because my thinking is, like, even if you go back to 524, you had mentioned the, the image of uh, Odessa, uh, Back then, they weren't keeping this thing in glass. I'm sure they were trotting it out in the sunlight, <laughs> passing it around. No, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, and so how did this thing stay intact? Two thousand years. Well, there's your mystery, isn't yeah. it? Uh, I, I they it stayed intact because, and here's my theory yeah. on it: the Christians who picked up the cloth revered it. This was the this was their their savior. This was his. The guy that they loved, so they they took it with them. They took it to worship to to at least have a not to worship, probably to remember him by. And I don't know that that the shroud image was so. Uh, you know, I don't know that they saw that uh, because it may have taken years for this thing to develop like it did. But anyway, they took it with them. They got out of of uh, 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 Israel, where they were being persecuted, went up, went started going up north, went to Edessa, obviously hid it in a in this place where it was found later, uh, and uh, when it was found, then 
everybody proclaimed, well, not everybody, but Christians proclaimed it. It was the burial cloth of Jesus. It probably got in the hands, and we don't know who that was, who, who took it. But it was well, well, soon quick, taken to Constantinople, where in Constantinople it was it was worshipped as the burial cloth of Jesus. And, and we have historical uh, record of uh, early Christians traveling from Israel to, to Constantinople and Odessa. And oh, Palestine. yes, yes, we do. Yeah, yeah, that's the way they moved. That's the because, way they went. Yes, that's the way they went. And, and it makes sense. I mean, uh, when he died, uh, the Christians were, were beginning to be purged. Yeah. And so they went north. Yeah, that's that's accepted. And you kind of want to know. It makes sense that they would want to keep this quiet. You know, they wouldn't want to blast this from the rooftop. Otherwise, every home in this town would be raided by these Roman soldiers. You know, they'd be going door to door. Oh, absolutely. This, this was, yeah, absolutely. This was their this was their their leader, and they that was the last remnant they had of him. But remember that three days later, they begin to see, he he, yeah. he begins to appear. And so uh, who knows what he told them or what what was said. I don't know, but... Uh, and 500 they, people were convinced. <laughs> like, within a yeah, very short time. Yeah. Yeah, when, you, when you go back and read these scriptures, and it's very convincing. Now, what about this yes. fellow, Godfrey de Charney? I, I, I apologize. I can't read my own handwriting, but this fellow, this uh, Knights Templar, who it came into his position. How does he yeah. describe coming into possession of this item? Well, he, he doesn't. Yes, uh, yeah. What happens is... Godfrey de Charney, I don't know what happened to him, but the the Templars, he, he was one of their leaders. And the Templars, there's lots of literature, people who study that, of him, of them worshiping what they called a, a, a sacred head. Mm. They don't, they apparently, you know, the shroud was folded uh, so that you just saw the head and maybe a little bit of the upper chest. And they call it the the sacred head. And that's what, what I think was the Shroud of Turin. It was folded, and it kept. They kept folding it until they would take it out. Uh, when it got to Constantinople, uh, well, excuse me, I'm a little ahead of myself there, aren't I? Uh, when when the the temp, there's a 200 year area where we don't have much other than the Templars worshiping. A, a sacred head of, uh, you know, a, 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 a replica of Jesus. Mm. They don't call it the Shroud of Turin. It hadn't gotten there yet. But they call it the uh, Edessan Shroud. And uh, it when, when, when it comes back and surfaces uh, in France in, in the 13th century, it's in... Uh, Godfrey de Charny is a... Uh, probably a son or... Or see, he is, his name is the same, right. and that's the guy who has it. So the the Templars, there's a lot of literature where the Templars talk about worshiping this head, and some of them say it's a full body, but uh, you can't. That's a that's a very um, undocumented. Uh, no, I mean that's documented, but you can't connect the two until you get. Godfrey de Charney. But now, now you say they were uh, worshiping this head, this part portion of the shroud that was folded up. But I, I, I thought that we couldn't really see that image until they took a negative of the photo and all that kind of stuff. That's true. And until eighteen, until uh, yeah, eighteen ninety eight, all that was on the shroud, all the people knew about the shroud of Turin, was this stick drawing kind gotcha. of thing, folded up. It wasn't until that first photograph was taken that the astounding thing, as I said, the, it's described that uh, Secondo Pia, who took that photograph, that first photograph, he nearly dropped the plate on the floor. Because when he looked, when he was souping his negative, he, he'd taken a picture, which is a negative image on, a, on, on, the, on the shroud, and he was souping his, 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 suddenly he sees a real live guy. And, and that was so astounding. And that's when the modern story of the Shroud began. Uh, right, so if, I, they, if they're worshiping this item that way back in 524 in Odessa and then later on, but, and they can't see anything on there like we see today from these photographs, they, that, that's, pretty much, that's pretty significant in my opinion, right? Well, 
what they see is that stick drawing. I call it a stick drawing. It's the negative. The negative is on the cloth itself. You have to take a picture of the negative and look in the negative that you've just taken, and then you see the positive, the reversal. So the people from the very beginning of time, they, they always had what in effect was a negative. But they, they, they weren't like you and I. They don't know what a positive negative is. What they believed was here's the cloth that wrapped his face it does have, you know, a face. It right. has a body. It has, every, When you get away from the face, it's generally the same kind of picture. But it's a negative, so it, it's strange to, to us. But in their mind, they might have even thought, well, gee, this is the way Jesus left his picture. They, they didn't know what positive negative was. So they whatever was on that cloth, which is the negative, what you can see today if you go and see it, I'm one of the few people alive who actually saw it without any kind of cover or anything. I'll never forget it. I mm. kept getting closer closer and closer to Did it. Did you feel any energy I'm, when you were near it? No, no. Okay. I, what I was worried about was I started sna- snapping pictures, right. and uh, uh, I thought, oh, my gosh, what's this? I'm getting closer, and there's no glass in front right. of it. One of these people with me, and there was a big crowd, could rip it down and, and, and wow. burn it. Yeah, anyway. just like you're not even allowed to take flash photos at Graceland because it'll damage. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but exactly. hey, go ahead, take a picture. Oh, Mr. Wilcox, go ahead. Oh, bonjour. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, we only yeah. got about five or six minutes left, okay? And I, I've really enjoyed this. It's great. I'd love to have you come back and tell me about Patton and this other thing about the Japanese uh, trying to get the bomb. Uh, two we'll do more it. recent books. And even the JFK one you wrote. Uh, great stuff here. But now, to, I hate to, to do this at the end of the show, but what, Devil's Advocate. Who are the guys who are saying that this thing is, is a forgery? What are they saying? What's the Devil's Advocate on this topic? There's only, you know, when you go to there anybody who has studied it, with the exception of and I, uh, with three people about, um, and I would say it would be 500 to three, uh, they, they all are mesmerized by these facts that we've been talking about. There's no way to explain them. If you just look at the picture of the, the, the negative, of the Shroud of Turin that shows the positive. There's no way to explain it. And yet, when I go to um, Wikipedia, yeah. the third paragraph of a 25-page article has Joe N- Nichols in it saying it's a painted fake. This is total bias baloney. And... Uh, there's no reason that should be there except that we're talking about the shroud of if this were the shroud of uh, Aristotle nobody'd have a, a breath about it mm. but since it's Jesus we have a problem nobody wants to go along with this possibly being evidence of the resurrection so you get the third paragraph in the wikipedia article is joe nichols article it's a painted fake he's absurd he's wrong you know, there's no way it's a painted fake. So now, do you think this inspired your, your faith? Say that again? Because when I first asked you if you went into religion uh, editor uh, because of your faith, you said, I didn't really have a big faith back then, but you said now you do have a strong faith uh, in Christianity, I suppose. Yes. Uh, has this been a big uh, um, my, foundation? My immediate answer to that is no, but, uh, you know, I, I can't really say that because... I believe, I believe in in Jesus. I'm a Christian, uh, and I pray to Jesus. But I still, this is a an, an, an object. It's not God. All right. And but it's, it could be a, it's, it could be it could be there for the the last chance <laughs> for people who, who who are so rationalistic that they won't believe anything except what what can be proven to them to show them but i revere this but i also look at it like a like you would a a puzzle i i don't know if i've answered your question but uh, well, well, the one last question is your faith catholicism or is it more uh, non-denominational 
No, no. Uh, I was brought up, brought up as a Presbyterian, although I, I, I would say that I'm a Catholic in the sense that the Catholicism is the oldest religion for Christians, and uh, they have done the most work. So I'm totally... Uh, uh, I, 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 I endorse... Catholicism in that sense that it's got it's the oldest religion the re- oldest Christian religion and it goes back to farthest so I'm a Christian but uh, I, I was brought up as a Presbyterian I got you I, I started out Catholic then I became Pentecostal uh, non-denominational Assembly of God for a while but then mostly non-denominational uh, Pentecostal Robert K. Wilcox is our guest today and we've been talking about his book the Truth About the Shroud of Turin, Solving the Mystery. And it's the second of two books he's written about the Shroud of Turin. But if you go to his Amazon page or his website, robertkwilcox.com, he's written many, many books, a lot of World War II stuff. Uh, the Target Patton, the, the plot to assassinate General George S. Patton. Another one here, Target JFK, the spy who killed Kennedy. I'd love to hear about that. Great stuff here from our guest, uh, Mr. Robert K. Wilcox. What would you like to leave us with before we go? Well, I, I think the Shroud of Turin is uh, uh, instrumental to anyone who wants to look into it because it's a, it's an unsolved mystery, and they've had a hundred years to solve it, and nobody can. Mm-hmm. It wrapped the historical person Jesus, and I think it has evidence of the resurrection, and I think it's certainly worthwhile looking into. And your books have these photos that you took in person. Absolutely. Oh, Everything boy. in there, in, uh, in in my books, yes, absolutely. Oh, man, my audience loves that kind of stuff. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, I, <laughs> oh, they love that kind of stuff. Robert K. Wilkins, they won't, they, yeah. they won't be wasting their time, I don't think. It's something to know about. Thank you so much, man. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks a lot, Ed. Good night, sir. Good night.